Hey, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight I'm continuing in the study of the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to start with chapter 4, verse 1, and let's see how far I can get. Um, I'm going to look at it first in the KJV, and then also probably look at it in the Amplified version. Sometimes the Amplified is helpful. So let's begin. Oh, by the way, uh, if you have not seen the previous studies uh, uh, on the book of Ecclesiastes, the first three chapters, uh, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. All right, so let's begin. Chapter 4, verse 1. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. All right. So uh, what he's done so far in the first few chapters is he's examined his life. And, and reflect, he's reflecting it near the end of his life. And he's saying that all these things have not brought him satisfaction. Uh, you know, acquiring wealth and wisdom. And, and uh, it's all, he turns out that all these things that he's accomplished. And this is King Solomon. He was considered the right, wisest man in the world. Many people say the wisest man ever. Uh, he was the richest man in the world. He, did, he just had so much, accomplished so much, and he's reflecting and saying, it, it's all vanity, it's all meaningless. And so keeping that in mind as we continue, I'm going to look at verse um, 1 in the Amplified and see how it sounds. <clears throat> then I looked again and considered all the acts of oppression that were being practiced <clears throat> under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. Well, he's he's saying that you know that it, it's 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 a sad state in the world. And he's looking at every place under the sun, which means the the whole world. He's saying in the entire world, people are being oppressed and they're being oppressed by powerful people and there's no one there to comfort them uh, sounds like nothing's really changed has it <laughs> now let's continue on the kjv chapter 4 verse 2 says wherefore i praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are, are yet alive Well, I'm not sure how to take that verse. I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. In other words, he's, I guess he's saying it, it, it for many people, it's, it's, it would be better to be dead. Life is so horrible for many people that, that, that their life is uh, just misery. So perhaps it would be better if they were just dead. And in the Amplifies, it says it this way. So I congratulated and thought more fortunate are those who are already dead than the living who are still living. Uh, sounds like uh, the world is in a very sad state as he's reflecting on it. He's become, I guess, grown to be very, very cynical. <laughs> I guess I share his cynicism. Here it is, 2016, and... I, I've grown to be quite cynical too, feeling like uh, fatalistic that uh, things are bad and they're just going to get worse. But I know the end of the story. I've read the entire book. I know how it plays out. And once it is written, then it cannot be changed. So I know uh, that uh, eventually history will come to a climax. Jesus will return. Uh, there will be a judgment, uh, and uh, the lost, those people who never put their faith in God, particularly 
put their faith in Jesus Christ, our great Savior God, uh, they're lost and they will be found lacking and they will suffer the second death in the lake of fire. And then all of those, all of us who have put our faith in Jesus, um, we have eternal life in the kingdom of God. So the universe will be destroyed with fervent fire. God will create a new heaven, a new earth, and we will enjoy the new creation and live in bliss and happiness forever and ever and ever with our eternal life. Uh, so this is how it's going to play out. So I'm optimistic, I'm confident, I'm joyful about the future. But as I look at the world today, and as Solomon looked at the world in his time, it, it appears he's he's gotten very, very cynical, and uh, it's, the world is in a very sad state even then. Go back to the KJV. Um, verse 3, uh, Yea, better is he than both they, which hath not yet been, uh, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. And in the Amplifies, it phrases it this way, but better off than either of them. Now, either of them is uh, referring back to uh, those who are already dead, and the other group is those who are still alive, but in, in misery and under oppression. So better than both of those groups, he says, is the one who has not yet been born, who has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Now, this is uh, so, so beautifully written, it's so, so beautifully stated. It's, it's poetic, it's, it's just majestic, it's just glorious the way the book of Ecclesiastes is, is written. And yet it's it's a very sad, very sad story. Um, so I'm, I'm enjoying it in that respect. And again, I've read this book before, so I don't want to jump ahead. But uh, so far, it's a very gloomy, cynical uh, description of everything. <laughs> Verse 4 in the KJV says, Again, I considered all travail and every right work that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Vanity, vexation of spirit means basically it's just, it's all meaningless. Even all the good works that we do, uh, all the accomplishments, uh, all the successes, it's it, it, reflecting on it at the end of his life. He said, it's all meaningless. Uh, verse four in the Amplified says, I have seen that every effort in labor and every skill in work comes from man's rivalry with his neighbor. This too is vanity, futility, false pride, and chasing after the wind. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, I, I, I'm just really struck. As I read, reading Ecclesiastes, and then I've also read the book of Job. We just did a, completed a study on Job recently. And the language is just amazing to me. Uh, I don't think you can read any of the best-selling novels uh, of history. Uh, no matter how great the story is in the secular world, even if it was uh, had a powerful message and a very meaningful message, uh, the, the writing can't compare to the writing of Job, the speeches of Job and, and of his, uh, his critics. And, and now we're seeing in Ecclesiastes the same thing, that the language is, it just uh, it blows me away, the beauty, beauty of how he's stating this, and yet the subject matter is depressing and, and uh, fatalistic and cynical. Let me go on now to verse uh, 5 in the KJV. The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. Wow. What does that mean? Uh, verse uh, 5 in the Amplified phrases it. The fool folds his hands together and consumes his own flesh, destroying himself by idleness and apathy. Yeah. So, 
uh, destroying his flesh is not, um, according to the Amplified, is not referencing um, cannibalism, self-consumption of your own flesh. It's uh, it's uh, you're being destroyed. Your life is being destroyed by I, being I, uh, idleness and apathy. Verse six in the KJV says, "Better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail." and vexation of spirit. So this it reminds me also a little bit about Proverbs. I've also been doing study and teaching on the book of Proverbs now for several months, getting near the end. There's 31 chapters in Proverbs. I think I'm on chapter 28 or 29 now. And uh, it's this kind of a statement you find in Proverbs all the time, better is. So there's always a comparison between uh, it's better to be um, uh, a, a righteous person, a good person with very little material stuff than an evil person that has a lot of wealth. So in here it's saying better is a handful with quietness. Just You don't have to have a lot of material stuff. You can have just enough to get by, just enough food to sustain you and in a nice relaxing, relaxing home rather than having plenty but living in a place where there's just travail, you know, there's tension, there's strife. In the, in the um, Amplified, it's phrased this way, one handful of rest and patience is better than two fists full of labor and chasing after the wind. Hmm. All right, and verse seven in the KJV says, then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. <laughs> vanity under the sun, so vanity everywhere. And then the Amplified says, then I looked again at vanity under the sun in one of its peculiar forms, uh, verse 8 in the KJV is, There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, uh, yet there, there no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, For whom do I labor, and I bereave my soul of good. This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. Yeah, to be alone. I mean, if you accomplish everything, if you work really hard and you accomplish a lot and you're striving and you're accumulating and you're getting these uh, supposed successes in life, but you're all alone, what's the point, he's saying. In verse 8 in the, in the Amplified says it this way, there was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a child nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, for whom do I labor and deprive myself pleasure? This too is vanity, a wisp of smoke, self-conceit. Yes, it is a painful effort and an unhappy task. Now, uh, number verse 9 in the KJV, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. So it's it's kind of connected to the previous thought of a, saying it's better to have a friend, better have a family, better have a spouse, better have a brother than being all alone. And in t verse 10 in the Amplified says, um, for if either of them falls, I know it says two are better than one because they have a more satisfying return for their labor. For if, if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and does not have another to lift him up. And I've, I've certainly experienced this. Uh, I'm so thankful that I had a, have a wife that loved me and cared for me in, in 2014. Uh, I had a, a whole bunch of operations and hospitalization and it really needed help and thank you Jesus I, I have a loving wonderful wife that was faithful and helped me in my time of need and I really not only appreciated her more than ever but I really felt pity and sadness for those people who were alone um, okay give me just um, a minute I'll excuse myself just for one minute. I'll come back as quickly as, as possible.
Oh, gosh. Oh, man, I realized what I just did. Uh, if you're watching this video, I, pardon me, I, I left and then forgot to turn my mic back on. So I'm going to have to re-explain these last few verses here. Uh, but it, it, verse uh, 15 and 16, it says, I consider all the living which walk under the sun with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. There is no end of all the people, even of all that have been with, been before them. They also that come after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. So this is really talking about the, uh, the good, the, the king that uh, was not wise, that would not be instructed any longer, was replaced by the young king, who the young person who is heir, who is wise, and he, he, he becomes king. Uh, but the, and all the people unite behind him. But when the next generation and the next generation come, it's uh, there's still. Um, it turns out that even even he is. Um, yet those who come later will not be happy with him. There's never going to be a continuous contentment and happy among mankind. That is until the end of time when history runs out. Jesus returns he sets things right and he sets us up in eternity as i said earlier only then but until then all the things that man pursues um, in solomon's case wisdom wealth fame acquiring everything uh, everything under the sun he he accomplished and, and accumulated he's reflecting on it and saying none of it none of it Nothing gave him satisfaction. Nothing made him content. It's all vanity, vexation of spirit. So in the end, he's he realizing that the only thing that really satisfies, the only thing that fills this hole in your heart, it's God-shaped hole. And you need God to, to give you contentment. And, and God provides meaning without God. There is no meaning to life. And this God that you need is Jesus Christ, our great Savior God. There is one true God. And the Bible says that he became a man named Jesus Christ. God manifested the flesh. Why did God become a man and come down from heaven to earth? Jesus said it was so that he can give his life as a ransom. Now, a ransom is a payment made to set someone free. Why did you need to be set free? Because the Bible says uh, that we're all condemned. He that believeth not is condemned. Uh, if you believe in Jesus, you're not condemned. So Jesus came to free us from condemnation. Why are we condemned? The Bible says because we are all sinners. It says all have sinned. No one is righteous, not even one. And because of sin, Man cannot ever have a relationship with God. This sin was a barrier. And God understood that in order for man to be reconciled with God, the sin problem had to be removed. So he became a man named Jesus, and he gave his life as a ransom. He died on a cross as a payment for our sins. So the sin barrier, the sin problem has been resolved. The Bible says Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. If propitiation means full payment, everything that's satisfaction, paid in full. Uh, uh, and he says, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. The sin barrier is removed. Now man can have a relationship with God, but it's not forced upon you. It's offered to you. The Bible says that salvation is a free gift. It says the wages of sin is death. Because a man is a sinner, we're destined to die one time, and then we get resurrected and judged, and then most people will suffer the second death because they did not receive the gift of life. They re either rejected Jesus, didn't pursue Jesus, didn't, didn't even have a desire for a relationship with God, and for that reason, they never received the gift of life. So the wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's Romans uh, 6.23. So Jesus died for our sins, but he was buried, and on the third day he was raised back to life, raised bodily. And he, he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days. They saw him. They talked to him. They touched him. They ate with him. And this bodily resurrection is the proof that, that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He, they demanded a sign. Jesus claimed to be God and Savior and the source of life. That's, those are outrageous claims. And they said, well, give us a sign and prove it. He said, the sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And he was speaking uh, symbolically about his death, burial, and resurrection. So he, he promised he would raise himself from the dead. He, he predicted that they're out to kill me, they're going to kill me, and in my death will serve as a payment for sins. And that did happen. But he didn't stay dead. He, he did as he promised. He raised himself back to life. And that resurrection is the proof, the sign, the evidence that he has claimed were true. He is God. He is Savior. He is the sole source of eternal life. And Jesus says that he offers life everlasting to you and to me and to everyone. Uh, there, to whosoever, no, no exceptions. Anybody can have it. Uh, there's only one thing required of you. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means that accept the fact that you're in a position that hope that's hopeless, that you can't get to heaven by your own efforts. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. So in other words, not by you doing good works and working your way to heaven, but according to his mercy, he saved us. God will be merciful to you. God is gracious to you. God will give you eternal life as a free gift because he loves you that much. Uh, but you've got to reject the idea that you can get there on your own and instead rely on Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus means depend on Jesus. Rely on him. Put your faith in him. When you put your faith in Jesus, he gives you eternal life in heaven as a free gift. It's a promise from God. Therefore, it's guaranteed because the Bible says God cannot lie. God cannot break a promise. That's why I'm certain I'm going to heaven. It's not because I'm a better person than you. It's not because I deserve it. It's only because I believe Jesus, his promise that he'll give me eternal life if I trusted him. And I trusted him, so I'm going to heaven. I want you to go to heaven too. Put your faith in Jesus now. All right, thank you for watching tonight. And I hope you will join me uh, for these live broadcasts nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.